It's a crossover Thursday here on the Locked on Giants podcast. Joining me will be David Harrison, one of the co-hosts of the Locked on Washington football team podcast. He's going to break down all we need to know about the Washington football team, who the Giants face today on Thursday Night Football. That's coming up in just a moment. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, New York Giant fans, to the latest edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Trena. Happy Thursday. Happy game day to everybody. That's right. The Giants are playing the Washington football team tonight on Thursday night football. So as we do every Thursday, it is our crossover show and coming up in segments two and three, David Harrison, one of the co-hosts of locked on Washington football is going to join me and he's going to break everything down. We need to know about the Washington football team. And also just want to remind you that if you want to hear what I had to say about the New York giants, check those guys out their podcast. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to their program. And you can hear everything I had to say about that. I know David mentioned it a couple of times during our discussion. He mentioned some stuff that we, that we talked about in my segment. So I recommend you check both of them out if you have the time to do it. Um, It was a pretty good, some pretty good uh, football conversation. And also just as a FYI, the conversation was taped on Tuesday, but the information is still pretty good. So anyway, this part is actually being taped on Wednesday. So we have some updated information for you regarding the New York Giants. I'm going to spend some time talking about that before we get to the crossover segment. And uh, we got to go with the injury report. So the final injury report for the Giants is out. And um, no Cam Brown, hamstring, no Evan Ingram, uh, calf injury, and no Shane Lemieux, knee injury. Now, Ingram, you know, even though head coach Joe Judge spoke about hopefully getting Ingram back, I mean, realistically, that was not going to happen. I think a better chance for Ingram's return is going to be week three because the Giants, of course, will have now about 10 days in between week two and week three. And they'll be at home, more importantly, um, in week three against the Atlanta Falcons. The injury to Shane Lemieux. Let's talk about that one, because this is kind of a one that I'm watching and I've been watching ever since Sunday when we first learned that Lemieux's knee acted up. So to recap, Lemieux started in week one, played about 11 snaps and then came out of the game. He was replaced by Ben Bredesen. Lemieux, remember, suffered a partially torn patella tendon back in early August in training camp. And we didn't see him in any of the preseason games. We barely saw him at practice. Uh, the last week of the preseason, when they went, when the Giants went to have their joint practices with the Patriots, uh, Lemieux was left behind for treatment, which I thought was weird at the time because he had gone out to Cleveland with the team for the joint practices. And now all of a sudden he was being left at home for treatment. So that to me kind of raised a little bit of a, of a red flag, if you will. Anyway, fast forward. So Lemieux doesn't play, you know, he starts the game, comes out, he's replaced by Bredesen, and lo and behold, he lands on the injury report on Monday. Now, right from the get-go, when I heard he wasn't on the injury report leading into week one, I thought to myself, how can that be? You know, because just how his summer went to not have him on that injury report. And I guess the Giants had hoped to maybe rehab that injury without any kind of you know, surgical intervention or anything like that. But what I was always concerned with, with that injury was that given what an offense alignment has to do to push off of that knee, I was like, you know, if that knee's not fully healed, he's only going to aggravate it and have more problems down the line. I was hoping I would be wrong, but uh, there was always that possibility. So anyway, Lemieux is not going to play. I would not be surprised if Lemieux lands on short-term IR, all right? So again, the IR rules now for the entire year, same as last year. So if a player goes on IR, he has to miss a minimum of three weeks, and then he could be activated. There's no 
you know, wait time or anything like that. Um, once he's designated to return, it's just a matter of getting him back into um, football shape and getting him back on the field. And teams can activate any number of, of uh, players who are on IR. So it's not, you know, three, which was the original number under the new CBA. Prior to that, it was only two. So that's what I think is going to happen with Shane Lemieux. All right. So now what does that mean for the Giants offensive line? Do they go back to Ben Bredesen at left guard or do they maybe go in another direction? Here's what I think is going to happen. And this is just my opinion, just based on, you know, the film work I did based on the stat work I did and a gut feeling I have. I would not be surprised, and I'm not saying I endorse this move, by the way, but I would not be surprised if the Giants move Nick Gates from center to guard and they insert Billy Price at center. Now, I don't want to see that happen for several reasons. Number one, at this point, considering that the Giants had um, a walkthrough practice On Tuesday, a walkthrough on Wednesday. To me, to make that move now, I think you're taking a huge, huge risk. You know, I would feel more comfortable. I mean, if they're going to make that move, I would feel more comfortable if they made that move for week three, if Lemieux could not go. All right. Now, I don't have a problem necessarily with moving Gates out to, to guard. I've always thought that Gates might be a better guard anyway. And he's had experience there. And don't forget, the coaches had him practice there over the summer. He was working some reps over at uh, left guard and right guard. So it's not like he's, he would be going in ice cold into the position. But for me, my, my thinking has always been that, you know, if you have to plug in a hole on the offensive line, do a straight up one for one. Don't shuffle guys around. You know, don't, don't start moving two, three, four guys around to get the right combination. That's now is not the time to do that. All right. Now here's the other concern I have with this possibility. And again, this is only my guess as to what I think might happen. If you have a new center, how is that going to affect the quarterback center exchange? You know, you got to remember Daniel Jones and Nick Gates have spent a lot of time working on the quarterback center exchange probably a lot more time than Billy Price and Daniel Jones have. Because remember, Billy Price came, I think it was August 30th, he was traded, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's that's the day he came. So he's had about roughly, I don't know, six, six or seven, maybe eight practices with the Giants. And how much could they have theoretically worked on that quarterback center exchange? You know, certainly in, you know, in practice in week one, Gates was going to be the center. So I can't imagine they spent a whole lot of time having the backups, you know, work with the quarterback. I don't know, because remember during the season, we are not allowed, the media is not allowed to see the entire practice. So I'm just, you know, guessing here, but the thought of moving uh, Nick Gates out of center at this juncture doesn't exactly sit well with me. And I'm really hoping that the coaching staff doesn't go in that direction. At this point, I'd rather see Bredesen, who admittedly, you know, wasn't really that great in run blocking and had some struggles, a few struggles with the pass blocking. So I kind of would get it if the Giants want to, you know, plug that up, but I don't know if this is the the week to do it. Um, Now, the flip side of it is, is the Giants are going against a very, very good Washington defensive front. So you would want to reinforce with your best guys um, this week and not have to wait. But for me, the trade-off, like I said, especially given Daniel Jones's ball security issues and, and, and all that stuff, I don't know that I would do it this week. So it's kind of, you know, six of one, half a dozen of, of another, as far as, you know, the pros and cons, I think. But um, I would not be surprised if the Giants go in that direction. Again, I hope they don't. I hope it's just Bredesen is back in that starting role. But um, we'll see if that's what they do. And if they do, of course, that will be a topic of conversation that I will have with David Turner when we do the Friday show. So, um, so yeah, we will see if that is what the coaches decide to do.
All right, Giant fans, be sure to stick around. David Harrison, the co-host of the Locked On Washington football team podcast, is going to join me for the crossover section. We're going to talk Washington offense in segment two, then Washington defense and special teams in segment three. And don't forget, you can hear what I had to say about the New York Giants in response to David's questions on the Locked On Washington football team podcast. There will be a link to the show in the uh, show notes below. So be sure to check that out. And uh, we will be right back after this. All right, Giant fans, coming up, we have the crossover show with David Harrison. He is one of the co-hosts of the Locked On Washington football team podcast. But first, no matter what your need for a car, Truck Rock Auto is sure to have it in its extensive online catalog. RockAuto.com offers brand name parts for every make, model, and manufacturer at highly competitive prices, and they ship right to your door. Visit RockAuto.com and be sure to write down Locked On in their How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know we sent you. That's RockAuto.com. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car or truck will ever need. RockAuto.com. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to Crossover Thursday. It is the New York Giants at the Washington football team this Thursday night. The battle of the division rivals, Giants winners of the last five straight over the Washington football team. But hey, the Washington football team, they are the defending NFC East champions and a team that's looking pretty good, uh, at least on paper, especially that defense. And we're going to talk about all that here to join me. From the Locked On Washington Football Team podcast is one of the co-hosts, David Harrison. David, thank you as always for joining me. Always glad to talk football with you. Let's jump right in on this one. Short work week for uh, Giants and for Washington. Every team kind of handles things a little differently. Mm-hmm. What take us inside the mood right now of Washington? You know, especially coming off that disappointing loss to the to the uh, Los Angeles Chargers Sunday. Where are they mentally? And do you think, you know, they were deflated by that loss? Uh, I think, you know, definitely disappointed. I think that's that's definitely a good word to put on it. You know, this team knows that they are capable of playing better than they did. And uh, defensively, you know, you, you did get two sacks. You got an interception, a fumble. Uh, but I think that the the 74% allowed third down conversion rate is, is if, if I were Jack Del Rio, I would, I would just print out a big old Word document that says 74% on it and tack it up in the, in the, in the meeting rooms and every meeting room and and defensive room uh, and just, you know, remind people of that because that is not what you expect from the Washington football team defense, you know, and uh, give credit to the Los Angeles chargers. They were getting the ball out quick. Justin Herbert was making some really good throws, but then there were some times though where he had, I mean, three to five seconds just to stand there, uh, you know, statuesque, you know, like it was a California Sunday uh, instead of a DC Sunday. And, and those are not uh, the types of things that you want from this Washington football team defense. So, uh, a little bit of disappointment there on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, generally speaking, they did some good things. They had they had a good amount of scoring drives. Ryan Fitzpatrick got hurt on the fourth possession of the game, but before that, he had led scoring drives in the first two out of the three. So that's you know, sixty six percent scoring rate uh, is usually going to do well. There were field goals. You'd rather have uh, touchdowns, obviously. But then Taylor Heineke comes in. They eventually find the end zone. Um, when you when you look forward to this game. You're going to be happy that Taylor Heineke got, you know, really a full half of football. I mean, he was he was in there for the first half, but it was really kind of the end of the first half. Uh, so he had a real full half of, of trying to execute this offense and getting a little bit comfortable. Um, that's going to help you Thursday night. Obviously, you don't want to lose your starter, uh, but I suppose hindsight being 2020 and taking the human aspect out of it, you don't want to celebrate an injury. But, you know, if it's got to happen, you want to be able to get your back up at least two quarters of football before he comes in against the division rival. So that's what they have. Now, we talked about in the previous segment about how the offense probably won't change that much with Heineke as quarterback. But another guy we have to talk about who's missing or will be missing, I believe, from that offense is receiver Curtis Samuel, who I believe is injured. I I forget what the injury is, but he's got a groin injury, groin injury. And he's probably not going to play, I would think. Right. No, he's on the IR. So he's out until at least after Buffalo. Okay, so that said, you know, that's two key facets of the Mm -hmm. Washington offense missing how much does that offense change now without without uh Fitzpatrick and without Samuel yeah I mean it's it's hard to talk about it in in the aspects of change without Curtis Samuel especially uh we'll talk about the quarterback the Ryan Fitzpatrick Taylor Heineke change I think you kind of nailed it when I asked you what your thoughts were from a defensive standpoint 
about whether or not you have to play that team differently. And I know Leonard Williams said it's really not that much different. Ron Rivera said it's really not going to be much different. And I think Scott Turner has the same approach. They were looking for a quarterback. And, and when they went out and got Ryan Fitzpatrick, I think that's kind of the theme that they were looking for is a guy who could stand in the pocket and make NFL throws, but could also move if he needed to. And I don't know if a little bit of that was in anticipation of the offensive line not being the greatest uh, in the National Football League, or if you just enjoy that versatility. I mean, versatility is, is a key factor uh, in today's NFL. So you, you see wide receivers more than ever playing outside and, and base sets and then you know moving into the slot as, as that slot receiver when usually that's your third guy that comes onto the field. So versatility is key, and I think that's what Taylor Heineke brings. Ryan Fitzpatrick brings a little bit of that, some underrated athleticism as well. So I think you're going to be similar there. Now, with Curtis Samuel, I think that when he does get on the field, which, you know, hopefully the Giants see him in this next contest, uh, not not obviously not in week two, I think the offense will take on a different dynamic, but he's been injured for so long and has been out of the practices, out of the preseason, didn't play in regular season week one, obviously, uh, that it's hard to say that the offense changes because we don't know what it looks like with Curtis Samuel. Uh, right now we know kind of what we expect it to look like with Curtis Samuel, and we expect a lot more emotion, a lot more misdirection, a lot more end-around type of things. Um, and that's, you know, to make the defenses play sideline to sideline as well as up and down the field. But without him on the field right now, we haven't been able to see that come to fruition. So a little bit of less, you know, a little bit less dynamic from the Washington football team offense than what it would look like on paper if Curtis Samuel was healthy. So that being said, you mentioned that you don't know what the offense is going to look like. But if you had to take a, a educated guess based on what you have seen, yeah. what's the bread and butter of that offense? Uh, it's definitely so for me, if I'm Scott Turner, it's it's passing to set up the run. Uh, and last week they looked it seemed a little bit more like they wanted to run to set up the pass. And, and I kind of I kind of get that. But Antonio Gibson, not really a bruiser type. He's more of a slasher type of one cut back, you know, find him a hole, let him accelerate, get get you, you know, three to five yards. If he finds a big hole, you get it even more. Uh, and there were some good runs, you know, in week one against the Chargers defense. But then you would also see some negative ones, some stop at the goal at the at the line of scrimmage, some losses stuff like that, because this team's strength is not, in my eyes, running the football. In my eyes, it's, it's in spreading the defense out. And you have Logan Thomas to do that. Uh, Deami Brown is a guy that everybody's excited about. Even Adam Humphreys is very shifty. He doesn't really have long speed, but he's got short area burst uh, and quickness. And then Terry McLaurin. Uh, last, last week, Logan Thomas barely got involved in the offense in the first half. Terry McLaurin didn't even get a target until the third quarter. Uh, that's got to change. And I know that the team broadcast, D'Angelo Hall, Julie Donaldson, stuff like that, they were mentioning on the broadcast, uh, that that's got to change. If you've got a player like Terry McLaurin, you expect to be a number one wide receiver, you need to get him involved early. So in the first 10 snaps, I'm looking for the Washington uh, offense for Scott Turner to script plays to get the ball into the hands of Logan Thomas, Antonio Gibson, and Terry McLaurin at least once each in those first 10 plays. Start getting those weapons involved because we saw De'Ami Brown double covered way too much. And there's no reason a third round rookie should be getting double covered by a Los Angeles Chargers defense, unless the fact of the matter is they knew that they weren't going to test the coverage they were putting on guys like Terry McLaurin, force them to focus their defense on the stars. They're going to come out doing it anyway, show them that they're going to have to keep it there. That'll give you better opportunities with guys like De'Ami Brown and Adam Humphreys. And, you know, you mentioned Logan Thomas. I mean, the Giants last week against the tight ends of the Broncos they were a disaster. I yeah. mean, they they just got burnt left and right by Noah Font and and Albert O. Can't say the last name, so I'm not even going to attempt to butcher it. Um, so yeah, I mean, this if anything, this would be a good week for them to get uh, Logan Thomas and, and mm -hmm. involved in the game, and like you said, try to exploit the middle of the field because the Giants, like I said, they just they they went to more zone defense, I think, than I thought they would yeah. last week. Now, will that change this week? Maybe I think the absence of Samuel might, you know, change things up because now it's not a case of, okay, pick your poison. You know, now that maybe they can double up, I don't know, McLaurin and mm -hmm. take their chances with single coverage, but it'll be interesting to see what Patrick Graham comes up with for the giants. Uh, certainly he's got to come up with a better plan than he did last week. All right, Giant fans, coming up next, David Harrison and I talk about the Washington football team defense and special teams. But first, let me tell you about Bet Online. You can get all the latest news, odds, info, and sign up bonuses for all your sporting needs by heading over to betonline.ag on your laptop or mobile device. When you open an account and use our special promo code locked on, you will receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Again, that's code locked on for your 50% welcome bonus. Terms and conditions apply. 
Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Let's flip over to the Washington defense because to me, that defense is probably up there. I mean, this we're talking a top five defense, I think, yeah. in the NFL. That front seven is just a terror. Mm-hmm. You've got Montez Sweat and uh, Chase Young on your, your edges facing off against the combo of Nate Solder and Matt Parrott at right tackle and Andrew Thomas at left uh-huh. tackle. That matchup scares the Je- Jebezus out of me. What do you <laughs> think of that matches, matchup? And uh, can those guys be stopped, Sweat and uh, Young? I mean, unfortunately, they can. You know what I mean? And that's what happened against the Los Angeles Chargers. I mean, they, the, the Chargers had a new veteran uh, right tackle and a rookie left tackle. And they looked very good. They looked really good against Chase Young and Montez Sweat. And that's something that we talked about uh, on our show is that, you know, we want to see a little bit more from Chase Young, honestly. I, from week one, you know, and again, it's it's one game, so you, you don't want to draw you know definitive conclusions. But just looking at week one, when Chase Young is lined up on the right side of the defensive formation, so against your left tackle, he just looks more comfortable, looks more dynamic. You see some of those moves uh, kind of come out a little bit more on the left side of the defensive formation against the right tackle, uh, going up, up up against you know not subpar talent, but inexperienced talent, especially with that with that group. The Chargers had made mostly a brand new offensive line. Jack Del Rio, in my opinion, did not do enough. Uh, to stress out that offensive line. you got five guys working as one for the first time in a regular season game, getting the most action uh, they've gotten all year long. That's when the stunts should come out. That's when the disguises should come out. The pre-snap movement should be coming out to cause communication problems. Make that offensive line talk before the snap and then wait for them to miscommunicate, misread the play, and take advantage of whatever is left behind. And I just, to me, I didn't see enough of it. I don't know if Jack is, you know, he's an old school guy. He's kind of an upfront, you know, uh, nose in the dirt football guy, and you love that about him. Uh, but at the same time, today's game, you got to be a little bit more creative. And I know the giant side was talking about that uh, as well, coming out of their game. So if, if Jack Del Rio comes out and wants to do four on five, you know, up front for the most part, and, and kind of goes, goes about it the same way he did against the chargers, then yeah, it is, it is possible that those two guys can be at least stifled a little bit, two sacks for the defense uh, and total chase young didn't get one of those, but he did get some, some pressures on the quarterback and everything else, but it just, it wasn't quite enough. And then, like you were saying about the Giants, I mean, the middle part of that defense just got gashed. Uh, John Bostic, you know, in my opinion, just just wasn't doing enough. I think he's, it's showing that he's going to need to be replaced, you know, in, in, in the coming season. But we're, we got to get through this season. Uh, first, Jamin Davis looked like a rookie. Colt Holcomb led the team in tackles there as a linebacker, and that's great. Uh, but Bobby McCain, a free safety, was the second leading tackler for the Washington football team. When you got a safety up there in the top of tackles for your team, uh, that's never a good thing. And that's exactly what happened in week one. Now, speaking of that defensive secondary, which was going to be my next question there, um, probably, you know, they've got Landon Collins back, obviously. Cameron Curl, I think, is their their starting free safety. Yeah. you got a pair of solid cornerbacks, Jackson and Fuller, I think, are the two starters. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see that group being upgraded from last year, or or do you still have concerns about that group? I think it's an upgraded group. I think there's still a work in progress, and – you know, we use the term starter loosely, especially in the safety group. Like you got Cam Curl, Landon Collins, Bobby McCain, all those guys. Like they're, they're the three starters. It's just usually there's only two of them on the field. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a good safety group. It's a good quarterback group. William Jackson had some good plays. Uh, Benjamin St. Juice, the rookie out of Minnesota, looked really good in moments. Uh, he did give up a touchdown. But I mean, honestly, like he, he played it perfectly. There was nothing else he could have done. That was just a, a perfect ball uh, from Justin Herbert. So, I mean, it, it's there's a lot of potential there. I think like you. More zone uh, than I expected, especially when the front four wasn't getting home. Uh, you know, and again, it's, it's a lot of it is stylistic, it's preference based. You know what I mean? But when when I'm not getting home with my front four on the defense, I'd rather uh, bring a few more blitzes and run zone. Washington was playing a lot more zone, but also not bringing extra pressure. So uh, you know that gives them more time to find the empty spot in the zone. To me, it's it's kind of working a weakness against a weakness. Um, but again, everybody's got their own personal preferences and the only one who's right is the one who wins. You know what I mean? Um, so that's how it works. But yeah, more zone than I expected. We talked about a lot of man coverage during the offseason. So I think Chris would agree. Uh, the, the big thing, again, is just kind of taking week one, seeing where it changes in week two, because that's going to kind of give you the mindset of the coaching staff. And, you know, you've seen it as well as I have, Patricia. Sometimes coaching staff are like, no, my scheme is fine. The players just need to execute it better and they never change their scheme. Usually it's to the detriment of their careers, not the players' careers. Um, you really hope to see a little bit more creativity and, and mixing it up a little, especially that first drive. Uh, first drive of the game against the New York Giants, Daniel Jones is, is susceptible to pressure. 
um, they need they need to do something to uh, to to mix it up and get some pressure on Daniel Jones early. Now, before we wrap it up, I have to touch on uh, special teams because mm -hmm. you have a really good punter in Tressway who's yeah. a left footed punter, yeah. no less. Yep. And the ball coming off the foot of a left footed punter is a lot different than a righty. Mm -hmm. The Giants in the past, they would always bring up some kind of left footed uh, kicker in to simulate, you know, when they would have to play Tressway or any left footed kicker. Mm -hmm. They didn't this week because obviously short work week and everything mm -hmm. like that. That said, I mean, what the uh, the Washington punt team? I mean, what do you see from them? Do you think they they're better? Do you think there's an advantage there? Because the Giants last year struggled with starting field position, winning that battle, um, covering punts, returning punts. Um, looks like Jabril Peppers is going to be the punt returner this week. But you know, I I just look at that left-footed punter as a kind of the X factor, if you will, an advantage for Washington. Yeah. When you have something that people aren't used to seeing, it absolutely can be, especially if they're talented and trust way was one is one of the best in the business. I mean, uh, he had a punt, you know, in, in week one that I want to say landed about the 24 yard line and bounced about the seven yard line. I mean, that's, that's unheard of. And I don't know if, I don't know if you would honestly say he planned it that way, but it worked out that way. So you take it. Um, but yeah. Punt coverage. I mean, it, the, the entire third phase of the, of the game definitely looks upgraded after one week. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a commonly underrated and under talked about phase of the game, but in a game like this one, where you have two teams coming off of poor offensive performances, neither of them uh, hit the 20 point mark, you know, those special team field position could play huge in it. Cause I mean, if you start the ball at your own 48 and you get one first down, you can potentially get a field goal out of that. Um, so that's going to be hugely important. So I think you hit the nail on the head right there. And then on the other side of, of the kicking game, the return game as well, for Washington looks to be uh, upgraded. DeAndre Carter had some really nice returns uh, as the, as a Washington return man. It looks like a guy to me that eventually is going to get a touchdown this year on a return. Not sure it'll come in week two, but I think eventually that union is going to find a way to give him a lane. And then Dustin Hopkins, uh, most people wanted him replaced during the preseason. Uh, Ron Rivera kept preaching, you know, processes. And I don't think Pat that I've, after watching football this weekend, I don't think I've ever heard the field goal process talked about more in any other season than this one. It's just, it's wild to me how many people are talking about this process, but it is a, a process, you know, and, and Ron was, was patient with Dustin and with the group, with the group there. Uh, and they seem to have gotten figured out. I mean, he was, he was three for four uh, in week one, th uh, two of those came from 40 plus, which is, is great for him. Um, and so, you know, the special team seems to be the better, the best unit of the three right now. So that's, that's, bad in a sense because you know you lost the first game but it's also good in a sense because if they can stay there and the other two units can elevate then you've got a really good football team and i bring that up because with the giants offense struggling they got to win the starting field position battle that's yeah. why i bring that up and you know a lot of people when they talk about this game coming up they're not going to probably give a whole lot of attention to special teams but mm -hmm. It's important. And Giant fans always ask me, why did the Giants have a dozen special teams only players, guys on there? This is why, because right. you saw yeah. the offense struggle. And if you, can, if you can give them a short field to work on and help them out, even better. So, Absolutely. all right, final question before we let you go. What's your prediction? Mm, I'm going to have to go with Washington right now. And, and it's less, and, and again, we mentioned this when we were talking the other side of this crossover you know, I, I hate, I'm, I'm a nice person, generally speaking, and I root for human beings. You know what I mean? I have no faith in Daniel Jones right now. And, and, and for Daniel Jones, it's going to be, look, man, you're, you're not it until you show me that you are it. And so far, he's, he's just shown more of the same. Again, it's one week, so week two could be completely different, uh, Daniel Jones. But in, even with this defense not getting home as much as they wanted to in week one, even with the secondary playing a little bit more zone coverage, I mean, it, it feels to me like Daniel Jones is the kind of quarterback that's going to make the mistakes and hold the ball too long. Uh, Chase Young and Montez Sweat, they didn't get home a lot in, in week one, but when you hold that ball for four and a half seconds, they're going to get there. You know what I mean? It's Justin Herbert is doing a really good job of getting the ball out three seconds or less. Daniel Jones doesn't do that very well, uh, and he doesn't hold the ball very well. So uh, I, I could see two sacks from both Sweat and Young, uh, one of them being a strip fumble and that field position problem. If, if, the, if Washington jumps on that ball and it's inside the giant zone, there's your field position problem, and special teams didn't even have a chance uh, to affect it. So I, I got to go Washington on this one. Don't think it's going to be a blowout by any means. You're probably looking six to nine points somewhere, somewhere in that range, I think. Uh, but I definitely think Washington's got the upper hand, especially playing at home. 
Yeah, I think you might be right. I think the giant streak over them could be coming to an end. I, I, they just don't do well on Thursday night. They don't do well in primetime, period. I don't know what it is, but no. they've got some issues they've got to work out in a short work week. I mean, one practice on Tuesday, hit the road Wednesday after a walkthrough, and then Thursday night's the game, and just yeah. no time to really address the fundamental <laughs> issues that they experimented or, or they experienced rather in Sunday's game. So um, I'm hopeful, but. Realistically speaking, I'm concerned about this game from the Giants' perspective. Hopefully, uh, when I review the show tomorrow, um, review the game tomorrow, uh, it'll be good news for the Giant fans, or at least some good news, but we'll, of course, find out. All right, David, this was great. As always, it it was uh, fun talking ball with you. We will do this again later on in the year, obviously. Giant fans, be sure to check out David and his co-host, Chris Russell, They are the hosts of the Locked On Washington Football Team podcast. They do a great job. So if you want to get some more lowdown on Washington and the challenges and the question marks they're facing ahead of this game, check them out. They've got the lowdown. So for David Harrison, I am Patricia Traina. Giant fans, we will be back tomorrow with another David. David Turner will be joining me to break down the Giants-Washington football team game from Thursday night. Until then, have a great one, everybody.